Welcome to another weekend here on the platform. My name is Sam Omashe. On the program this week, I'll be speaking with the Bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Sokoto, Bishop Matthew Kuka. But before that, my column, The Return, will be read to you. Governor Godwin Obaseki's cheeks should bloom in his election victory. It is his supernova hour. The people illumined it, gave him their word, and beatified it in their vote. No one on earth has a ground to begrudge him. The people lined up, breasted the tape for him, appended their choice. Einek attested, and the tally anointed him the people's ally. Some have questioned the turnout. Few people came to the polls, but those who came conquered. It does not matter that one person or a million showed up. Democracy or a democratic constitution does not compel choice. If you want to vote, it is your right. You have the right not to use your right. It's thumbs up for those who thumbed down. Those who did not vote gave power to those who did. Democracy is about numbers. Numbers legitimize a vote. Superior numbers. It is not about eligible voters, but men and women who defied rain or sun or wind and spoke with their fingers. Democracy is about what is and not what might be. Some assert that Pastor Osage Izeyamu might have won if all voted. That is speculative. You don't count imaginary ballots. This malaise has afflicted democracy for decades. Trump won because blacks who gave Obama the edge shrank into their homes on polling day. Democracy is about rights, not who is right. The majority may be foolish, as philosopher John Stuart Mill has asserted in his On Liberty, but they are entitled to their foolishness. Democracy thrives more on culture than reason. Just as in Edo, we cannot rule out sentiment over enlightenment in the popular will. So, in Edo, the people won. But this is a time to rejoice, not to gloat. Governance is no party but work. If we all should squelch godfathers, we should not cherry-pick the autocrats we like or hate. It is not in the interest of democracy. Yet we lie if we deny that some individuals of certain skills and influences can ennoble democracies. Obama's candidacy drew momentum when men like Ted Kennedy endorsed him. Even in Edo State, I foresee those who defected to APC may start moving back home. In our politics, everyone is looking for a room with a view. In the final analysis, Governor Obaseki is now alone with Obaseki. Edo State is now his responsibility for the next four years. He had a great career in the private sector. We need that expertise in government. He vilified the Lagos where he made his mark and earned his daily bread. It is not the lot of Lagos that hides the failures of this federation with its success. Yet, those who fatten on Lagos come back to bite it. Obasaki has to unite his state. It is still divided in spite of his solid vote. He won, not because voters love Izeyamu less, but because they love Edo more. He must turn Edo love into progress. Welcome to Big Talk. My guest is Bishop Matthew Kuka. Thank you for being on the program today. Thank you very much, Sam, for having me. Yes, um, we've been trying to um, have this conversation for a while, but uh, Providence has, has actually made it to coincide with Nigeria's 60th um, anniversary. On reflection, what is going on in your mind now as Nigeria turns... 
Well, a million things are going on in my mind, uh, and I'm sure the same things that are going in the minds of so many people from the president of Nigeria to um, the most ordinary person, if there is such a person on the streets. Uh, I think the same sentiments are in the hearts and minds of millions and millions of Nigerians around the world. A feeling of a bit of despondency that uh, when you look back at where, how we started out uh, from the starting blocks, you read the speech of uh, our first and most beloved Prime Minister, Tafa Balewa, a speech that is that, that really, really every citizen must read. You cannot, you know, fail, fail to just seem to almost despair, you know, and wonder where did it all go wrong and where was the road not taken? You know, that was where did we take the wrong turn? So, um, I think this is also a, a time for sobriety and a time for renewal, and hopefully that we can pick ourselves up again and see how best we can reposition ourselves, learning from the mistakes of the last, uh, the very tragic mistakes of the last uh, 60 or so years. Well, some people have said um, the problem with Nigeria is leadership. Some people have said the problem with Nigeria is system. Where do you, where do you weigh in on this matter? Well, I don't like to use such categorical expressions as the problem with Nigeria, uh, because the issues are much more complicated than that. You know, and if you take um, an academic uh, you know, point of view, you will also appreciate the fact that 60 years for a new nation are really not enough time for us to uh, um, you know, do a proper analysis of where we should be. Uh, but you're right. I mean, there, there's frustration, but there are systemic and structural problems. Um, and I think there were structural reforms right from the, from the very beginning of this process. And, and that also has to do a lot with understanding uh, the really what really led to our Nigeria's independence. Uh, and the fact that perhaps the British simply took a, a strategic decision. Um, whether we were ready for independence is another thing altogether. But whether we had the right tools for independence is a different matter altogether. But, Either way, I think that if we go back to where we started in 1960, I'm convinced that we had the right quality and caliber of men and women spread across the country. Um, and their ideals and idealisms have really not been surpassed. So we have to return to the scene of the crime, which is really January 15, 1966. I think this is where it all began to go. It, be, it really, really began to go horribly, horribly, horribly wrong. Uh, so most of, in my view, uh, you know, the first six years were not perfect, but definitely we saw ourselves pretty well positioned, you know, to, 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 to achieve most of the things that, we, that could have been possible for a nation like Nigeria to achieve. Some people have said actually that it is an issue of structure. We had, we had the Westminster system in the 1960s. We had the presidential system. Um, we had it in the Second Republic. And some people say what we really have is a hybrid. Some people have said, let us go back to the Westminster system where we had the prime minister, the parliamentary system, which is the British model. And, uh, and, that, and that, no, 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 no. Some people have said, no, no, we can't do that because Nigeria has a sort of monarchical background. Nigeria has a monarchical background and that the presidential system of the strongman pays better for our own um, development. But we have seen that even both have created tremendous obstacles to getting Nigeria from point A to point B. Well, you know what they say, thunder doesn't strike twice in one place. Um, the first thing is we get a bit nostalgic about the past and we always progress in reverse because we are convinced that yesterday was better than today. And if you look back now, you can trace this, this romanticization with the past all the way down. People are terribly frustrated now and wonder whether this is what, whether things were not better in Jonathan's time. In Jonathan's time, people said, well, they were wondering whether it really things were not better under, had, you know, had uh, Yaradua not died, you know, would things not have been better? Well, and we keep going all the way down. If you go back to even your, you know, your humble self and the, and, and the, you know, your newspaper, The Nation, uh, beginning around the month of August, uh, and all the articles and all the, all the kind of things that, uh, you know, people were saying when this administration came, 
um, you just wonder whether this, you know, where again, where did it all began to, you know, to really seriously go wrong? Now, the, of course, it is easy for us, as is the case, to quarrel with, you know, the workman quarreling with his tools. In my view, the issue is not whether it is a Westminster parliamentary system or whether it is the presidential system, the American presidential system, whether it's a hybrid or, or whatever. It is that any either way you look at this whole thing, uh, the kind of, I've always said, and I repeat myself, that governance is science. And that requires a certain kind of mental toughness, but also mental clarity. So when we compare ourselves, for example, with, uh, with, with, with Singapore and the Asian Tigers, we must go back and locate the growth of these countries, not necessarily in the system they adopt, adopted, but the quality of minds that guided these systems. You know, so for me, uh, being a Catholic priest, I said, I said to my parishioners, the solution to a bad marriage is not a new marriage. Uh, we often think that if we simply change the systems and we do nothing, you know, to, to, to really look at how do, who are the, how do we recruit leadership? How do people get access into, you know, into public life? And if you look at it right from the, from, from the beginning, but even it, things became even worse, progressively worse with the military, is that uh, we really had no idea who was going to be president. Uh, the, the, you know, the next leader was just a gone, a gone away. Um, and we, we, the, the, the military introduced all kinds of characters. You remember the case of Gimka, who, who couldn't tell the difference between uh, AM and PM. Uh, so the result is that we 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 really not given and paid attention to the nature of intellectual uh, debate that go with the creation of a managing a state, a managing diversities. So Nigeria cannot respond to some of the things that we're talking about, whether it's Westminster parliamentary system or the, or the, or the, or the presidential system. It is the, the fact that clearly most of the operators of the systems themselves don't seem to understand the systems, nor do they understand the country and the context. So for me, these are some of the problems and the lack of a, of a steady uh, roadmap, so to say, uh, the disruptive systems we've had in the last few years, uh, a country like Nigeria, America is just talking about their 46 president after 200 years of democracy. Nigeria has come close to about, you know, a third, you know, in less than 60 years. So, you know, this, for me, these are some of the problems that we've never really paid attention to the how of making governance and making things work. Well, in a sense, in a sense, you are even weighing in on the side of man rather than things. You know, was it is man that makes things possible. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson said there's properly no history except the biographies of great men. And it is very obvious from our own history that the men have failed the system rather than the system failed the men because the men create the systems. And if the system fails, if the system fails because the man has not been able to do it very well. That's why they say sometimes that when um, a, a workman has any problems, he blames the tools because he himself is the problem. The Nigerian tool has been failing because the Nigerian has not worked itself very well. That, is, that, that seems to be, to seem to be where you are weighing in this matter. Well, you know, I think part of our problem, of course, is that we outsource our duties and responsibilities either to God or to other external agencies. And things are wrong in Nigeria because the president is a bad man or the governor is a bad man. Well, again, these are products of, of the same system that we are operating in. Uh, but definitely, as I said, you know, we've really not been, the system has not been friendly to the emergence of people with a certain level of understanding of how systems work. Now, the volatility in the political system, most of which came with the military, uh, simply meant that it, it is doubtful that the military voluntarily decided they wanted to go. Now, by 1999, again, as you can see, even whenever the military decided they wanted to step aside, they believed that, as Babangira himself very well said, we know who, who will not succeed us. And we, 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 we don't know who will succeed us, but we know who will not succeed us. Now, any system that doesn't have a certain kind of uncertainty as to leadership, you know, suffers from the kind of thing that we are facing. For example, in another two or three or so years, we're going to be conducting an election. Now, Nigerians don't know who's going to be the president because all of us are supposed to be sitting and waiting, wondering whom is the president going to anoint. 
most people have no idea who their governor is going to be because it depends on who the governor, the which of his boys he decides he wants to make governor. Now, this, you know, you cannot run a system of this nature and hope that you will get a different outcome. Again, I'll give you an example of Lee Kuan Yew. Now, when you look at Singapore, his son is president, but it is very difficult to quarrel with his son succeeding him because they will tell you in Cambridge, wherever the young man went to study, he had the best grades. So, but a system like with the one we have in Nigeria, where very clearly nepotism, feudalism have a substitute for democracy, where there is no transparency, where the system is skewed against men and women with competence, then you have to deal with the consequences of what we are facing now. So when you talk about government of strong men, you can't talk about strong men in the democracy. Because even then, I mean, we've had a few strong men with all the guns around them. But it just didn't seem that they had the mental capacity to design a roadmap that can help us manage the diversity in our resources, human and otherwise. So the result is you will get this outcome if you're dealing with an environment where extractive, uh, you know, which is an extractive economy, where leadership doesn't have to think about anything to do because we are just rent collectors. So this, an aggregate of all this is why governance is failing in many parts of Africa, not only Nigeria. So the permanent struggle for access to power is really access to resources and access to use these resources irresponsibly. This is what you know governance is seen as in the in the eyes of people. So people are not you are not likely to have somebody who feels that he, he wants to be president of Nigeria, and this is the evidence of the notes that he has taken. This this, this is the ev evidence of the consultation that he or she has made. Um, we just have, as I've always said. President landing on, on Nigerian soil by parachute, you know, because they are brought together by interests that are often, very often, far from the goalposts of democracy. So these are some of the very definite issues that I think we need to try and find a way of resolving. You have made that, that, that point very interestingly, and that takes me back to 2015, when um, after the Jonathan um, electoral debacle, as I, as I might put it, um, Buhari became president. And there was this issue about, okay, what do we do now with the issue of corruption? How do we move forward? And you famously said it was time to move on. Can you elaborate on that? Do you think that you should have said it? I absolutely stand by everything that I say. And um, I have your newspaper here, a copy of your paper, uh, dated 24th of, uh, of August, your own column, in which you wrote, and I quote you, Kuka, a constant motif in Nigerian debates, is a master of the rigmarole. You hardly know where he stands on an issue. He navigates a warren of narratives, entices you with a false ability to spin a yarn, pros of the pros and cons with, with almost equal, equal points and be met in a never, in, and bets in a never land. Now, um, this is largely part of the conversation that went on in the nation. Uh, Femi Orubebe and a few of your columnists went to town and everybody, I mean, you know, most newspapers you open are within that sort of time you know, the house literally came down. People were calling me and asking me to apologize to Nigerians. And I'm like, I'm about to apologize for what, really? What am I to apologize for? I am convinced, not that, not necessarily because I'm right. I am convinced that based on the evidence before me, this is the conclusion that I have reached. You know, that in my, in my view, fighting corruption is an, it's an intellectual exercise. I didn't believe that then as now, we have developed the, 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 the necessary discipline and reflex to fight corruption. Now, all of you that went to town and were celebrating, uh, I end up, you know, it was very interesting because I have some of the newspaper cuttings. A gentleman called Garbadin Mohammed said, ended his article by saying, as it stands, Kuka is crying over a wolf that only he can see. Although, of course, he, you know, he took me to the cleaners. But why I was laughing about all these people is that I know that, okay, my friend Garbadi finally got a job with NNP, you know, for making all the right noises. But he had barely said it when they sacked him because they discovered he had some other tendencies. But that's not the point. The point is that those who wrote a lot of, and said a lot of these things against me, 
much later came back to ask me, what did you see that the rest of us did not see? Now, I have something here that again, let me, if you, if I, if I, if you can just indulge me. Within the same period, a gentleman published uh, you know, an article, one Idris Ahmed. Apparently Idris Ahmed is now living in Germany. But he came to my house still Philly, or I don't know by what means, because he wrote an article saying that Jonathan had built a two, bi a two billion naira house for me, the house I'm living in, and that uh, he, he described the house graphically. But then um, he said all kinds of things, but to now on the 13th of June, he wrote on Twitter, I, Dr. Idris Ahmed, whose picture appears in this message, on this day, Saturday, the 13th of June, 2020, hereby declare that the Nigerian president and all his military service chiefs are war criminals. I call on patriotic Nigerians at home and around the world to join my human rights organization, COPS, to file complaints of war crimes and, and crimes against humanity against these callous evil men at The Hague. Thanks, and God save Nigeria and Nigeria. The fact of the matter is that I can stand any kind of scrutiny on what I said then and now. And I'm sure that you more than any other person, where is the, where is the current chairman of EFCC today? Uh, what, what evidence can you really show that we have made progress in this fight? And that thing, okay, where is Jonathan today? At that time, everybody said Jonathan was going to go to jail. Last time I checked, only yesterday, you saw him on television. He's literally now the diplomatic darling boy of the same president. So I, I say this because Nigerians like get very excited. And it is precisely because don't look at these gift horses in the mouth. This is why we end up making the same mistakes over and over and over and over. And we'll continue to make the mistakes. And so long as we don't understand put sentiments aside and subject leadership to thorough interrogation, we will never be able to get the kind of leader that we think can take us. We just imagine that people have come with a baggage. They themselves didn't say a baggage that is constructed and an image that is marketed. And then we discover only later on that we bought the wrong horse. So there's nothing I said then that has been proven wrong. And I repeat myself over and over. If somebody presents a superior argument, fine. But the evidence that is empirically verifiable validates the position that I took there. Namely, building and uniting our country was to me far more important than the fight against corruption because I was convinced that this fight would not be different from other fights. And I have been proven right. Just uh, before the program ends, this is my poem in honor of Leah Sharibu. Your country was free 60 years ago, amidst guns and pomp. Today, many say its independence is only a tag, so no need to brag. But you, Leah, are one of its children, even in the midst of festivity of over one identity, you have only one identity, and that's captivity. Thank you for watching the program today. You can Catch up with my published column on www.samomashe.com. Also, follow me on Twitter. My handle is at Samomashe. And until next time, be good.